So what we had at the end of the last video is essentially um, a way to build out of a countable set. So basically the idea was what we had kind of arrived at is that if somebody were to hand you a numbered list of infinite binary strings, then what you could do is you could arrange them in this table way and you could kind of create out of it another infinite binary string that's not in the list that they gave you. You can always, get, if they give you a list, a countable list, a, a numbered list of, of infinite binary strings, then you can always build a binary string that's not in the set that they gave you. You can always build your way out through this process of diagonalization. So another thing that we know we can produce a comprehensive numbered list of, that we can kind of, we, a, a collection of things that we can actually number one, two, three, and, and in a way to get all of them, is the set of Turing machines. And so here's the, here's the pitch, here's the idea for what we're going to do now. If we can find a way to, given a Turing machine, kind of define a characteristic infinite binary sequence, if we can associate to each Turing machine some infinite binary string that in some, in some ways, in, in some sense, characterizes it, maybe not uniquely, but, but just characterizes it, um, then we can do this argument again and arrive at an infinite binary string that can't be characteristic of any Turing machine. That, 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 that can't be like something that we got in the way that we produced it. And then, you know, there's a good chance that from that we can produce a, uh, something that's not computable. Assuming, and that's really going to come down to the way that we define these characteristic binary sequences. So that's the idea. Um, so that's the goal. So keep in mind now that we are talking about Turing machines in the context of decision problems. And so what we're going to assume is that Turing machines are built to halt in acceptance or rejection. Uh, the output isn't really important to us anymore. Uh, what's important is whether or not the Turing machine says yes or no or neither. And so, but, but based on what I just said, we almost already sort of have an infinite binary sequence because um, in the context of decision problems, Turing machines do one of three things. Uh, they either uh, accept the input. So if I give it an input, what's it going to do? It can either accept the input, it can reject the input, or it can fail to halt at all. goes on forever, never halts. So what we're going to do is we're going to lump these two together. And basically, we're going to say, in order to kind of define our zeros and ones on this thing, we're going to say that a Turing machine, given an input, and that's by, and by the way, that is going to be how we move kind of right. The, 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 the row is going to correspond to all of the inputs that I can give a Turing machine. So remember that the set of all finite binary strings, or yeah, the set of all finite strings in general is uh, countable. And so I can produce a numbered list of them one at a time. So I can talk about the, set, the first string and the second string and the third string. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a binary sequence out of a Turing machine by kind of looking through the strings one at a time and writing down a zero if it accepts or sorry, a one if it accepts, and a zero if it doesn't accept. That is to say, if it rejects or it doesn't halt at all. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so, so given a binary sequence, or sorry, given a Turing machine. Oh my God, given a Turing machine M, uh, define a binary sequence uh, by um, having entries correspond to uh, inputs and a zero or a one depending on whether uh, it, I'm actually going to say give it a one or a zero so that I can kind of give the other two in the right order. Uh, give it a 1 or a 0, depending on whether or not it accepts or doesn't accept. So if it accepts, I'm going to give it a 1. 
and or doesn't accept. That isn't that isn't to say reject, by the way. Uh, it doesn't accept means it either rejects or doesn't halt at all. But it's going to do one of those things. It's either going to accept or it, it doesn't, and we're going to basically produce an infinite binary string that way. And so now this table takes on new meaning. So just to kind of make this clear, we have a we have a numbered list of all the Turing machines. We can label the Turing machines one at a time uh, and have a comprehensive list of it. And so every single one of the Turing machines is going to have a binary string here, an infinite binary string. And but so but we still have this table. And so basically the meaning of this table now is that the rows uh, of the table, the rows correspond to Turing machines. Each row is a Turing machine. So this, this fourth row here, this is the fourth machine, right, it, et cetera. Uh, and the columns correspond to inputs to the Turing machine. So this basically, like this right here, this is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the sixth input. So that's how this is going to work. So basically, you can look right here and see this, like, you know, four, uh, five uh, entry, right? Um, or I guess this is the sixth. So, like, four, six position is a zero. So, meaning. Uh, that the uh, fourth Turing machine doesn't accept uh, the sixth input. So that's our that's our table. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and just like that, we've diagonalized out. Uh, let's think about that more clearly. Again, it's the exact same argument. If I have this binary string, then I immediately have, just kind of by the way I drew it, um, if I just invert every single one of these diagonal bits, I have something that, I, that can't occur as a row anywhere on here. And so this, this, uh, this infinite binary string here, d bar, I wrote these in advance. The diagonal here is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, going down. And so if I just invert all of those and keep doing that forever, I get an infinite binary string that can't possibly be one of these. And so it can't possibly be the characteristic binary sequence of any Turing machine. So this D here can't uh, be the sequence for any Turing machine. And so in a sense, what we have with this D bar is something that has a, is a very likely candidate for an uncomputable problem. But in order to kind of confirm that, we need to be a little more careful about this. We need to think harder about what we just created, essentially. So let's think harder about what we just created. Um, but we are going to try to prove that this thing is not computable. So we claim, but what does that even mean, by the way? Remember, uh, but infinite binary strings are doing a lot of work right now. We're assigning an infinite binary string to every Turing machine, but keep in mind also that what we're going to generally think about when we think about infinite binary strings are decision problems, languages. Infinite binary strings are always decision problems. This right here is some kind of problem in which the ones are the yes answers and the zeros are the no answers. It's our job to figure out what kind of a problem this is. What is this really as a decision problem? What is it asking? Because it isn't just a, 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 a meaningless sequence of bits. It actually does mean something. So what does it mean? Let's start with D. Let's start with D and not D bar to make, it, to make things a little simpler for ourselves, uh, a little less confusing. When do you get a one? You get a one when the third, when the, you get a one in the nth entry, right? Maybe this is the, four, let's say the third entry. You get, a, you get a one in the third entry if the third Turing machine accepts the third input, right? Same thing over here. This one occurs because the sixth Turing machine uh, supposedly accepts the sixth input. This zero here means that the, the fourth Turing machine uh, does, uh, doesn't accept the fourth input. So down here, we just get the kind of negative of that. This is a one because the first Turing machine uh, fails to accept or does not accept. Uh, it either rejects or it doesn't halt on the first input and so forth. So let's write that down. So D bar as a decision problem 
uh, is the problem. Uh, given an integer n, um, does the nth Turing machine either uh, reject or not halt at all on the nth input, the nth string? That's the question. Uh, and that is, a, that is a concrete question, right? It's a kind of strange and contrived question, but this is a decision problem, and it and it has physical meaning. We're talking; it's a meta question. It's 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 a question we're trying to solve with Turing machines. That's that's asking a non-trivial question about Turing machines, but it is a it is a valid decision problem. It's a valid problem that you might want to solve. Um, and we claim it's not computable. I claim it's not computable. It shouldn't be, right? It kind of feels like it shouldn't be, but we haven't really thought that through yet. So let's see why this isn't computable. And in order to see that, we're going to play a game. We're going to assume, we're going to play dumb and assume that it is computable. Suppose it were computable. So, so suppose it were computable. Then uh, there would be a Turing machine that uh, computes it, right? There's a Turing machine that halts always, and it accepts if it gets the right answer. If the, it accepts if the answer is yes, and it rejects if the answer is no. So then there exists... So that's what it means to say it's computable. There exists a Turing machine, I'll call it M sub D bar for now, I'm gonna rename it in a moment, um, which um, uh, accepts uh, an input, so, so which I'll say, uh, you know, which given an N uh, accepts if, um, nth machine uh, doesn't accept the nth input. And rejects if the nth machine does accept. The nth input. So that's what it means to have a computable uh, solution to this decision problem, d-bar. And so if there's a Turing machine that does this, then it's got to be somewhere on the table. So it's, it's, it's sequence, the sequence belonging to it uh, must be uh, on the table, in the table somewhere. So uh, suppose it's the uh, so let's suppose that it's it's the dth entry. Suppose it's the dth one. Suppose it's row d. And so to make uh, to, to to kind of go with that, I'm going to replace m sub d bar. I'm not not write it. I'm not not going to label it that way. I'm going to label it with m sub little d to indicate that it is that this this Turing machine that supposedly solves our um, decision problem. Is, is the dth row. And let's just say for kind of um, illustrative purposes that this is D. Let's just let the sixth row be D. So um, let's let let's that be D equals six. I don't, know it, I don't know if it's six. Let's just say it is six so we have something to look at. Um, so what we're going to do and what we should do, obviously what we should do, is we should probably look at this guy. Let's stare at that. Uh, in other words, what we're going to do is something very strange sounding. We're going to take the dth Turing machine and we're going to consider its operation on the dth input. So, so we have row D. So consider uh, M sub D's operation on the dth input. So it interprets this dth input as the integer d, right? So i.e. consider m sub d of d. What's it going to do there? Well, let's think about both cases. 
uh, first of all, there's a, there are only two cases, right? Because what it means to decide a problem is to always halt yes or no. It, uh, the, the Turing machine never gets confused and doesn't halt. If, if you have a computable solution, then, a then one of the key features of that is that it halts. So th there's only one of two things to consider here. So case one, let's consider the case where m sub d of d is equal to one. So let's say it, it, it accepts. So let's say, you know, equals one, i.e. Uh, deep input is accepted. So we've got case one. The, the case, case one is, what, is when the deep input is accepted. Let's uh, consider what that means in terms of the actual decision problem that we're talking about. So what this means, this means that the deep uh, uh, Turing machine um, uh, doesn't halt, either rejects or doesn't halt. Now that is in direct comp, comp and, but that's a problem, right? So this means that, so what we've just said, if it accepts, then what we're really saying is that the, that the deep Turing machine fails to, re fails to accept the deep input. That's what we're saying. Th let me repeat that. If we assume that the deep Turing machine get, gives us a one on the deep input, then we're really saying that the deep Turing machine accepts the deep input. So we're saying the exact opposite of what we said, of what we just said. That that this means, uh, this means, this in turn means that m sub d of d should be zero. So if we assume that it's a one, then by kind of uh, the nature of D, it needs to be a zero. It, it, you know, if, if this is a one, then th what that immediately tells you is that it's a zero. And so that's a contradiction. So that's uh, impossible, that's a contradiction. Uh, so it can't be one. So let's move on to case two. Let's suppose that m sub d of d is equal to a zero, i.e. the dth input is rejected. So this, what is this really saying? This means uh, that the dth Turing machine uh, accepts the dth input. But that's exactly the opposite of what we just said, i.e. <laughs> m sub d of d is equal to 1. Again, contradiction. So it can't be 0. But then it has to not halt. And so uh, we've really, so I mean, we've arrived at, a cro at a, the problem, right? If I assume that I have a Turing machine that decides d bar, then I don't, then, then it, it, that's a contradiction. I can't assume that. So uh, this, let me do some different color. Maybe I'll do it in blue. So the, therefore, uh, there can be no Turing machine uh, deciding d bar. d bar is an uncomputable problem. There is no Turing machine that will decide it. Um, and so that real, and so you can see, you know, just by kind of staring at this, you can see that this is really kind of just in words. Uh, and in terms of Turing machines, the same argument we gave in the last video. Uh, it really is just the kind of same diagonalizing out, but in terms of Turing machines. And this visualization, I think, kind of helps understand that. So, um, of course, this D bar is a kind of strange and contrived problem. There's a more general problem, uh, which would imply, you know, which, 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 if it were computable, would imply that D bar were computable, so it also can't be computable. So, um, a more general problem uh, but equally uncomputable problem uh, which we've proven is not computable um, is the following and I'm gonna call this problem H the halting problem H and it is the problem, uh, 
it is what well, it's it's basically the, the the following given uh an into two integers it's just basically going to be the entire table rather than just the diagonal given two integers m and n does the mth Turing machine halt on the nth input? Question mark. That's the decision problem. So given a Turing machine and given an input to that Turing machine, the halting problem is the question, does it halt? Does it stop? This problem is not computable. Uh, and we can prove that this problem is not computable because if it were, uh, then so would uh, d bar. Uh, the reason that it would be is because if it were, so suppose it were, suppose h were uh, computable by some machine m of uh, m sub h, let's say. Uh, then I could easily uh, create a machine deciding d bar. So what I could do to create it is this. And by the way, I'm going to do something for the first time that I, I'm sort of surprised I haven't done yet. Uh, which is the main reason that I wanted to talk about universal Turing machines, because given the church Turing thesis and given the, the existence of universal Turing machines, you kind of have all of the philosophical ammo that you need to justify whenever you want ha talking about Turing machines simulating other Turing machines or using or, or running another Turing machine like as a subroutine, right? That can just be talked about now. We can just kind of do that. So I'm going to use that in order to, I'm going to use that here. I'm going to say uh, to decide D bar. Um, uh, given an in, given an integer n, this is going to be kind of an algorithm using this machine here. You, you, given an integer m, uh, simulate uh, m sub uh, simulate the halting problems uh, Turing machine on the input n comma n, um, and then we're going to do one of two things depending on what the answer is. It's going to halt and give us an answer, right? So if m sub h of n n uh, rejects, um, then machine does not halt. So answer, so return, so uh, accept. So halt in acceptance. We want to halt in acceptance because the question we're trying to answer, this d bar question, is whether or not the machine does not halt or rejects. So that's not, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, D bar should be a, so, so the answer should be a one if the machine either rejects or doesn't halt. And so we need to halt in acceptance if we get a no answer from our halting problem algorithm. If it rejects, or if it accepts, uh, then the nth machine halts. Uh, therefore, we can simulate that. So then we're going to, so if, if it accepts and that we have assurance now that the nth machine halts, we still need to check whether it accepts or rejects, uh, but we know now that it'll halt. So we, therefore we can simulate uh, the nth machine knowing it'll halt uh, halt and then halting ourselves Uh, in acceptance, if that rejects and and uh, rejecting and in, in in rejection, if it if it accepts, so that's what we do. So if we have a general Turing machine that tells me whether or not the mth Turing machine halts in the nth input, then I can easily uh, use that to create a Turing machine that decides D, which I said is a contradiction. And the way we do that is given an N, you just simulate on the diagonal. You, simu you simulate the nth Turing machine on the nth input for the halting problem, which is more general. 
And then if you get a rejection, then you can halt an acceptance because that's the right answer. And then if it accepts, you still don't have the answer, but you know that the Turing machine halts. So you can simply simulate that Turing machine and then, uh, and then give, the give the answer according to what D wants, right? Acor you need to halt an acceptance if it rejects and, and re re uh, rejection if it accepts. And so that would decide D, and so D, but D is not decidable. So uh, thus, uh, H can't be computable because if it were, Uh, then D bar would be as well. And so we have proven that the halting problem is not computable. We have a very practical example of an uncomputable problem uh, that we sort of built ourselves from this diagonalization argument. And I proved this very carefully, and I realized that what I just did is probably going to be the hairiest part of the entire video. I know I had, a, or the entire series, I know I had a, I had a bit of trouble uh, trying to make this presentable, um, but this really is the heart, the beating heart of all of these videos. Um, really, it's the only thing that I need to prove carefully and fully. What we need to do now, and what the rest of these videos is going to be about, is essentially just at layering on context until we understand the kind of deep, deep-rooted implications of this towards uh, meta mathematics and and beyond. So that's that's what we'll do, be doing in the future.